sweating. <laughs> Pack is not here yet. Only good time, but slow from training again. Yep, he's got to work, hasn't he? Ben Falney, how you doing, mate? I'm all right, thank you. Thanks for coming on, mate. Yeah, good to be here. I need to warn you, as soon as he gets here, he's going to go straight in with threesomes with Beckham and he's going to ask inappropriate questions. Okay. So I'll just word you up. All right. <laughs> Correct. That's the first thing he said to David May. What? <laughs> so when, uh, when Beckham come in changing room, did he say, uh, I, 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 what did he say? I, he said something that didn't he? Did you smash her all over the place last night? Or did like you like fuck that? the shit out of her? It was, it was, uh, yeah, yeah. I won't say it, he's, it a, was... he's a treble winner and he's asking him <laughs> questions like that. that. Sounds like him. <laughs> <laughs> Bucks been out five, six months now, tackled. Yeah, it's been out, uh, came out in uh, middle of October. Um, as far as I'm aware, I don't know exactly the, you know, the final detail of how well it's done, but um, yeah, it was, a, it was a good exercise for me. It wasn't something that was on my radar and I, I actually really enjoyed doing it, especially the way that we, we put it together. It was... Um, Found it therapeutic. I did, yeah, I did because obviously, they, you know, did anybody that's read it, there's, you know, there's, there was obviously quite a few demons knocking about inside me from, uh, you know, from from the, the you know, the, the result of the tackle and and obviously where the the direction that my life took after that sort of thing. So, uh, so yeah, it was nice to to relive it. I mean, obviously, there were a few things that I'd rather not have relived, but. You can't really have one without the other. I needed yeah, to see yeah. the tackle again, for example, and uh, and yeah, it was um, it was a, a really good exercise, and I'm you know so grateful to to everybody that that contributed because it, I don't think it would have had the same impact but on, with the likes of Sir Alex Ferguson and some of the players that I made my debut with, like Brian Robson, and then obviously the players that have been well publicised, especially recently um, in the last few years with you know Gary Neville, David Beckham, Scolzi. Uh, so uh, to have their input to you know giving people an idea of you know what sort of player I was and what sort of player I, I perhaps could have been yeah. might have um, might have given well would definitely have given the story some weight. I think the I mean just to put it into context for people who might not have read the book might not know the story. I mean I've got some of the quotes here from. Nobby Styles, the closest thing to George Best he's ever seen. Yeah, I'm not. It's not a bad one, is it? I'm not so not sure. A bad place to start, <laughs> is it? I'm not quite so sure about that, but um, it, it was a, it was a true story. Um, a friend of mine who uh, whose father was was good friends with with some of the some of the players that um, that used to play for United years ago. Um, they used to meet up on a Sunday afternoon, and and uh, and Nobby Styles. Was uh, was one of those, and and one of the one of the guys who whose pub they used to meet up in 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 Sale, um, said to Nobby at the time, you know who who would who we to sort of look out for, um, and he'd just taken us on a on a trip to to play in the Milk Cup in in Northern Ireland. It was the you know, everybody remembers the class of ninety two for for being the first team to to win the win the Youth Cup for a you know a long long time since since the Busby Bay since George Best's era. Um, and people who don't know the story right the way through will know that that was actually the first thing that we won as a group. Yeah. Uh, we we started off in pre-season. At the end of pre-season, we played in this tournament, um, and I, I'd scored a goal um, where I'd sort of run from the halfway line and beat like five or six players, and I know that this was very, very soon after that tournament, so maybe that might have been fresh in his mind yeah. that, that, sealed the deal. that it was something that you used to see George Best do on a, you know, on a regular occasion. Yeah. So whether, you know, he, like I said, that was just fresh in his mind and he thought, that that was something that he could compare me to, um, but I mean that would have been a, a hell of a hype to have had to live up to. I mean George Best, I've never saw him obviously play live, but I've seen plenty of uh, VTs where I I used to think, well, you know, if somebody once even remotely sort of put me in the same sentence as George Best, then that has to be something that uh, that I, I should be very very proud, proud of. Yeah, without 100%. any question, and especially coming from from somebody who, who'd won the European Cup with Man United and, and who'd won a World Cup as well. So you know that in itself is uh, is something that would carry a lot of impact with people. That yeah. it came from somebody as as high high up on the, in the chain yeah. as as Nobby Styles was. But like I said, I mean that would have been. 
uh, it would have been something something else if I could have ever got anywhere close to it. But I think that you know that it, it was just something that that stuck in his mind from seeing me score a goal only a few weeks prior to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't play that down, mate. You know, uh, I've, oh. I've been ripping the ass out of it. <laughs> <laughs> the ta- the tagline of the book, the class of ninety ta- the class of ninety two star who didn't make it. Yeah, you know, there's. I think there's there's a prefer of stories of the wonder kid that hasn't made it at every club I imagine that I'm sure you you've heard of players at Sunderland and other clubs but I think what makes your story so unique is the and I think what resonates with the fans is those names that you were playing with you're at Manchester United you are held in such high regard you know, like I said, some of the other quotes here, Gary Neville, one of the most outstanding talents I've ever played with, David Beckham, he would have outdone us all. You know, Scholes, he was a step of us, he was a step of us all, you know, and it's those st- circumstances, I suppose, that makes that story stand out. There. Yes, yeah, I, and I think that um, it would it would never have been even in my mind if uh, if it hadn't have been for some of those people that I had played with to have even thought about doing a book. Um, and I had to be coerced into it anyway. I mean, it wasn't something that I jumped at the chance to do. I was still, you know, very very wary about the fact that, well, you know. Who, who basically would really be interested in that. But from the angle that we did it at with the names that you've just mentioned and, and putting together a, a list of about 45, 50 people that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that that had to have seen me before my injury and after. Um, and that sort of came together with a lot of people who played with me on a regular basis in the youth team, who played with me in the 92 team, who played with me when I when I made my debut, and then who saw me after. So Maisie, for example, Maisie only saw me after I'd done my injury. Yeah. He hadn't seen me play beforehand, even though, ironically, the club who, who I did my knee against was Blackburn, who he was playing mm. for at the yeah, time, yeah, albeit yeah. not in the team. So, so yeah, it, it, that was the... that that. It was really the the catalyst for me getting it started, and yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, getting in touch with people like Bex to say, you know, can we have like you know an hour of your time? It's not always easy because he's here, there, and everywhere, and he's a busy guy. But I think that because it was me, he um, he did it. I think yeah. If you, once he's saying yeah, then you you know that's the, the I regard everything, that every one of them lads are straight away have gone out the way kind of thing absolutely yeah, yeah. and I, and I feel very humble that they would that they would do that and I'm hoping that that's something to do with the fact that not only did they remember me as a as a as a very good player but they also you know think that I'm a decent player right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and and obviously when you finish playing football and you do things like this then then that's going to carry a, you know a hell of a lot more weight mm. than than just what they thought of yeah. you as a player I just heard a creak Big in? Yeah. Oh no, glass collector. Oh, here he is. Great operations turned up. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mate. How are you doing? Have you got a glass of red wine? I have. I certainly have. Hey, Hello, John. Oh, all right. I'm all right, mate. Nice to meet are you. you okay? okay? Yeah, good. Yeah, good. good. Sorry, I'm late. Someone said I was looking tubby in that last video, Sorry, so. I've got fucking work. <laughs> I've swerved that lager. <laughs> Fucking glass of red wine. Yeah. Well, Jesus. Wouldn't happen on your watch, would it? No. Just tell. Just on about starting out and stuff. So you wise or <laughs> not yet? No. I'm surprised. You had like three sentences. <laughs> I was warned. <laughs> We're not too shaggy yet. <laughs> go, go for a pint downstairs, Johnny. Like football shit out of there. <laughs> Jesus. Ah, oh dear. Where are we up to? What have I missed? We're just, only We're just getting into the gloop, I suppose, because, yeah, that injury, I think we'll get, but we'll come to it. But just growing up in that class of 92, I think initially, all them players, Old Trafford, Alex Ferguson, you know, being in that environment. You can, you can ask a question, you know. <laughs> you, can, you can get towards a question. You know what I mean? He knows, he knows where he were. He knows what he was. But Eric Harrison. Yeah, I was just thinking about a typical Yorkshireman who says it as it is. Yeah. <laughs> exactly right. And yeah, and you know, obviously very sad that, uh, you know, it was only a couple of weeks ago that we, we all attended his funeral up in Halifax and... Um, he was without question the, the the glue that kept us all together. I mean, right. along with the the manager as well, uh, they were cut very much from the same mould. 
um, proper old school, you know. And and I think that when well, I was just talking there about what you know, people will always remember the, the the likes of those lads as as players. But the people that actually do know them will realise that they're great lads as well. And that is all down to the grounding that we were given when we when we first arrived. Hard work, you know. We were still in a time as you would have been, John, when 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 you were you were getting there and you weren't getting in and getting buses home at 11, 12 o'clock at night after after first team games when you're in the boot room cleaning the boots and stuff like that. Things that the modern day, you know, young lad, if you like, of the academy doesn't have to no, do anymore. Um, but th- that was, you know, that was what brought us down to earth was the fact that we had to go cleaning cars and we had to, you know, sweep the stands and, and you know, everything that that a, a normal working person would, would have to get used to doing to be able to climb up the ladder, if you like. And that's where we had to start. Um, and that's where we got our, you know, our dedication to hard work, commitment, uh, respect as well. Um, and I think that th- those lads that, that were in my team that went on to, to great things and, and obviously are still doing great things now in whatever capacity they're working at, um, that is all down to, to what we were given mm. under Sir Alex and We've talked in particular a few times Eric Harrison. About- talked a few times about that old guard and character building from from the lads that you look up to who's who, who are you looking up to in that team and who's whose boots are you cleaning who do you get some stick on do you know what I can't remember whose boots I was actually cleaning because it used to change from season to season that went for, well, it was only a couple of seasons we had to do it but we had five or six people that we were, we were we, whose boots we you know, each had to clean but um but Brian Robson for me was always the you know the the one person that, that I always looked up to because he was the reason why I started kicking a ball in the first place when I saw him um, score that goal for England in 1982 after 27 seconds and I just thought you know that that's what I want to do that he's the he's the person that I want to be and, and he was the inspiration for me to to start you know kicking a ball against the wall going out with my dad etc and then to see him you know somewhat nine ten years later um, and actually being in the same club, being in the same building and walking down the stairs and he's got a, a shed load of New Balance boots. Um, and as I, as I was walking up past him, he said, what size are you? So I told, I told him what size, we were the same size and he gave me a pair of boots to try out. And when I went to give him him back at the end of pre-season, obviously, you know, so I got the blisters and not him. <laughs> he, um, he said, what were they like? And I said, yeah, they were great. And um, and he said, well, you can keep them. And that for me was was just, you know, one of the one of the highlights of my footballing career, believe it or not, because to have somebody like that who I'd followed for so, so long and then for him to actually give me a pair of boots um, was very special. I've still got them. I was just going to say, I've still got them. Yeah, I've still pride got Pride of place. Them. Absolutely pride of place, yeah. Did yeah, he have? So he, he had a lot of time for all the young lads. In the, most, up. most of them did. Most of them did. Um, the, there was, you know, very. I, I think the ones that we felt didn't, uh, and there weren't, and there wasn't many of them. I think it was just their way, as well, of building our character. You know, so rather than give us the softly, softly approach, it's basically like you come into the first team, you need to be good enough. You know, we're not carrying any passengers whether you're 16 21 or 25 this is you know this is what we are we're man united and you have to be good enough to come and train with us and ultimately play with us uh, and there were a, you know there were a few that that gave us a bit of a hard time but it whether it was to throw us off the scent or whether it was to you know to to build our character it, it whichever way around they did it it worked yeah I do you know we've what? spoke about it, haven't we we are uh, at times I always, I would say, it borders on bullying at times. It could be. I mean, we got that with all the, uh, the hazing, didn't we? Mm. With all, you know, the, the, the hazing. It's called where they, you know, where they, they give you like a bit of an initiation, so oh, yeah, right, yeah. screw bones yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So, uh, so we, you know, we we were basically the last group that was subject to that um, because they didn't want it to derail us and there was one incident where one of the lads who uh, who was on the receiving end of it uh, he didn't come into training the next day uh, and his father was uh, w- happened to be you know sort of quite close to to Brian Kidd uh, and in the evening he phoned Brian Kidd and he said listen this is what's going on and he said he's not coming in tomorrow uh, because I want this stopping it's not right um, and the very next morning, Eric Harrison came downstairs and he said, I want all the second year apprentices in my office now. And um, and after that, they came back downstairs and there, were, there wasn't another peep. 
What, what, what happened? happened? <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> what happened? Everybody's <laughs> oh, edge of our seat. <laughs> right. Well, the, I, I can't remember the incident as to what happened. I think he was. Um, it was one where they um, where they they wrapped the ball in a towel and they all you know started whacking <laughs> him with it. So, uh, so basically, they assaulted him. They assa- exactly. <laughs> That's a bit too much. Top and bottom of it. Yeah. I, 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 never got, I never got fucking ball and toweled. <laughs> yeah. I never got I'm that. The daddy that. Ball and <laughs> that, that wasn't from the first thing. That was from the second years. Sorry, that was the second year apprentices. That wasn't the first. They weren't involved in it at yeah, all. Yeah. Obviously, uh, this is just like you know the 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 like when you first go full time. Us. Yeah. What about? Um, you know that at Christmas, did you used to have to do stuff in we front had, of the first day? We had to do a Christmas play. <laughs> we had to do a Christmas play. I, I remember what part did you get? I, I, do you know what? I, I got Prince Charming. <laughs> was, Cind- was it Cinderella? And uh, and who was Cinderella? Fucking Robbie Savage. <laughs> <laughs> it was always going to be one. Uh, did he have the locks? I bet he, he, had the, chose, he had the he? hair. Yeah, he had the hair. And he'll and he'll tell you that un, unlike unlike him. <laughs> I've gone downhill and he's improved like a five wire. <laughs> yeah. I'll leave you to uh, I'll leave you to discuss we used that to, I, used to, I used to love we used to boot room brawls in any trouble oh, we know, we know all, you're wrestling get, I'll get in the boot room lights off and just fucking have it out. Proper like, scrap lag? Yeah, no, not prop, not punching, but we, everyone's in there wrestling trying to fucking put people on the backs and <laughs> lads are coming out with like dots on the back you know and the boots have all come off and been pushed into the the pegs with the boots on polish over everybody and everything <laughs> we're in there for a good 20 minutes you came out you were fucked sweating yeah. cobs covered in polish and you it was like, it was like been paintballing on your back where you'd been uh, yeah. it was fucking brilliant that was another one boot polish on your on your privates <laughs> that was a killer because you were scrubbing what, like pin bu- down and scrubbing like bugger to get it off <laughs> in the drawer we had some them we used to put boot polish on the receiver and the, on the telephone. So like Peter Reid obviously going and he got picked the phone up and he's walking around the training ground with a black ear. <laughs> Did you got him? <laughs> Bobby Saxton and that. What was the one with the, um, didn't, because re- obviously the, that thing you on about, about going through at Christmas and all that, that carried on. Did somebody offend Rude Van Nistelrooy one time? Did you hear about that? No. They dressed up as a horse. Don't forget I was, Yeah, I, I, know. I, I just wasn't sure if you'd heard about it. by the time that Rude got there. I wasn't sure if you'd heard, but, one of the, somebody must have gotten the short straw and they've had to pretend to be Rude Van Nistelrooy and just go with a long long head as a horse <laughs> and he spat his dummy out apparently. Oh dear. So uh, You've got to just take it out rough with this. I one, know. I mean we used to have to if we used to have to sing and the worst uh, the worst group we'd got a kit off they've got to run around the pitch yeah the we've had that as well yeah running around the cliff. When you get yeah. to the end they've all got the uh, fucking ice bucket just drench you. Obviously, this is middle of December. <laughs> Start like you fucking freeze. It's but as I say, it's bullying, but character building. Of, <laughs> character I remember, I remember one lad who was, he was the foreman two years above me. A lad called Jimmy Shields. He's a copper now, and uh, and he he had that in the snow, and he had to run round the cliff. I think it was three times with. It, absolutely nothing on but a pair of wellies <laughs> <laughs> with everybody and have, you, have you ever been to the cliff? no right so the, the the whole building is just completely glass that overlooks the training pitch and of course you, the whole windows from one end to the other are just kitchen staff the lot all kitchen staff everybody <laughs> just watching him run round with his wellies on as fast as he could and he wasn't the quickest either bless him. <laughs> neither were I <laughs> 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 Who did you knock about with the most out of? Um, I, I would say that the, the the lads that I was closest to, um, there was Bex, Gary, uh, Chris Casper, uh, and a lad called Mark Rawlinson, who ended up going playing down in Bournemouth. Um, and then I think he went across to Exeter, but he's also a copper now, believe it or not. Uh-huh. So, uh, and obviously Casper's involved with the, with the Salford City. Um, and, I mean, everybody knows what. What Gary and Bex are doing, but they were the lads that I uh, I, w- I spent pretty much most of my time with. Yeah, out, out on the pole with Bex and Neville. Um, well, Bex always had a girlfriend. Right. I yeah. can imagine Bex found it a lot easier than Gary did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, G- well, Gaz was with my sister. Right. Yeah, he was with my sister for about seven years. Oh, so he couldn't go on the pole. So, then. well, it was a bit tough. With, uh, <laughs> with, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, so, it's turning a blind eye yeah. to something. <laughs> that, that's probably a little bit too much, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, but no, Bex, from as long as I can remember, he always he always had a girlfriend. So, and you know, pretty much as ever since, to be honest with you. Um, Has he changed? No. 
Not in the slightest. No, I mean, he's a, he is a lot more wary now of being in public, but that's because he's, he be, you know, he he's one of the, be, one of the really. most, you know, photographed sportsmen still in the yeah. in the entire world. So yeah. there is, he is always extremely cautious about that. But when, when you actually, I mean, I saw him at Eric's funeral, but didn't really get a chance to chat with him that much because I couldn't stay and... Um, and the only time I saw him was in the church. But I saw him last year at his dad's 70th that he held at uh, Old Town Football. And he was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. No you, problems at all. Do you ever think he thinks to himself, I wish I'd just had another four or five years single? You yeah. know what I mean? Just really made it, made it pay away. You know <laughs> yeah, I mean? yeah. Before he met Victoria. <laughs> like another, another four or five years doing what I wanted. I hope you battered him for wearing that so wrong. Oh, that was just after the World Cup in France, wasn't yeah. it? And uh, I, I actually went to that game that he scored the free kick in at Columbia. A few of us went over to watch the game. And then uh, I was on holiday and I saw him in the sarong. And, but that was the year I left. So I probably couldn't give him as much, <laughs> yeah. as much grief as I, as I would have liked. Saying that though, I read, a, I read a quote from Giggs saying that he looks back on them photographs of his younger days thinking, what was I, what was I doing then? What was I wearing? But then... He has a look at me. He has a look at you and thinks, well, at least it weren't that bad. <laughs> yeah, I think my uh, my wardrobe was always uh, a good uh, a good starting point to have a good laugh at for, for most of those lads, there's no question. <laughs> I never wore a skirt, though. No, that's one step too far. No, I never wore a skirt. I don't, I, Sir Alex must have been pulling his hair out when he's seen it, Monday. Must have been thinking, what the fuck is he wearing? <laughs> what is he? What? One of my players is dressed in a sarong. I can't imagine many other. I can't imagine any other managers have ever been in that position. No, mine fucking certainly aren't. Suspenders and high heels and that, but never a sarong. <laughs> How did you get on with Ferguson? Really well. Yeah, really well. Um, I know that he was. He was really. I want to say disappointed, but I, I think he was a bit. Um, I was supposed to say upset when when I did my injury and when obviously I re he realised that I wasn't uh, I wasn't going to be the the asset to him that he he probably originally thought. Well, that as a that as a, a on a personal level or as an asset to you know when you say asset do you mean asset to the club yes. or yeah yeah I mean I, don't get me wrong I'm I'm hoping as well that he you know he felt upset for me on a personal level yeah. no quick because I I never gave him any problems. Um, I, I mean, there were there were maybe once or twice when he he sort of turned to me, but I I never I never got anything like some of the. I mean, if I'd have been there long enough, then I'm pretty sure that I would I would have seen him having a go at me, like I saw him having a go at at some of the others at certain times in in, in my career. But other than that, I, I I never had an issue with him at all. He, he I've got um, the, there's a letter that he wrote to me in you know, that, that's actually in the book, the you know like a version of it. Um, and he said that he, you know, he wanted to thank me for for never giving him any sleepless nights because he, you know, he had enough of them and I didn't add to it. Um, and I'm pretty sure, like I said, that if I'd have been uh, under his wing a, a little bit more than I was, then I'm I'm pretty sure that I would have I would have had you know more than one bollocking because um, mm. <laughs> I got him everywhere else. So. <laughs> so I know um, um, the the we talked about the injury. Which, tell us the build up. You'd already made your debut. I made my debut um, in the February of that year at West Ham. Um, and then I'd, I'd gone back and I played a couple of games in the reserves. And then it was FA Cup semi-final weekend or approaching to. Uh, and, and he said to me that Giggsy was struggling um, with his hamstrings. He wasn't too sure. And he wasn't going to prop take a risk with him. And he wanted me, he, he said that you, you, you you're ninety five percent certain you're gonna play in the semi final against Oldham. At Wembley. At Wembley. This was on the Sunday. Um and this was the beginning of the semi final was on the Sunday and this was the beginning of the week on the Monday. And I was already preparing to play a game this game that I eventually did play in against Blackburn on the Wednesday night. Um and I said to him, What do you want me to play? And he said, When was your last game? And it was wasn't until sort of ten days before because um, the reserves hadn't had a game the previous week and he said no he said it'd be a good idea for you to to you know go and get some into your legs and, and you know go and do an hour on uh, on Wednesday night at, at Gig Lane against Blackburn so I thought right okay I'm not you know it, it didn't have any impact with me I just said yeah right okay that's it seems like it. I think he, he said to me that Wembley should I play is a is a really sapping pitch and he said for anybody big, who, for anybody who's not big. who's not um <laughs> 
who's not played any games for a couple of weeks, you you know, you really will feel it. So I want you to go out and, you know, get some distance into your legs in the time that you that I feel is all you should stay on for. So anyway, I, I went out and everything was going great. I, I was having a good game. I think I'd scored one, I'd set another one up at least. Uh, we were cruising and I was enjoying myself. Ferguson in the stands he watching. He was in the stands watching, yeah. And uh, and he sent a message down to Jim Wrighton, our reserve team manager, who then shouted on and asked me how I was. And I just said, yeah, I'm fine. And he said, do you want to come off? And I said, no. Oh. <laughs> so uh, so that was it. I've, I've never given that response. Do you want to come off in a reserve game? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, before it was it, we've only played 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a yes. It's a yes from me. <laughs> was it was it in the back of your head that you've got the final Sunday? No. no. Once you're on the no apprehension. No, about nothing just... at all. And I didn't even I didn't even see past the end of that game that I was playing in. Never mind what you know what might have transpired on the Sunday. Uh, I was just an 18 year old kid who was enjoying giving this lad who was like you know 10 years my senior yeah, older, the run around. Nicky Marker was 29 at the time, and I was only 18. And and I. I I, I had no reason to to want to think about what could you know mm. what could be you know it turned out to be like ten minutes later. It's that was literally all it was. It was ten minutes later when it happened. So, so was, what, um, what happened? Like, I, it was just a horrific it, tackle. Yeah, it was a bad tackle. Um, and he just got. Think, do you think he had enough for an eighteen-year-old tournament? He had enough. Off? He'd had enough, and he followed. It's malicious, me. isn't it? As a full, but I mean, if you if you if you did ever see the tackle, if he followed me when I picked the ball, he followed me into or came towards me when I picked the ball up in the centre circle, and he's playing right back. Um, and as I approached him, and he came running towards me, the gap that he'd left in the fullback area, Clayton Blackmore had come airing up the outside from fullback, and I just put the ball into the space. And as I as I played the ball and then replanted my leg. He then hit me and he tackled me with his left foot. I mean, any defender will tell you that it's very, very difficult mm. to tackle with your weaker foot. Mm. And very, very few defenders can actually do it. And he just saw an opportunity and he took it. And he tackled me just below me, me right knee. Uh, what and was, that the, was that? What was the diagnosis? Yeah, what was the. I know what was it? Straight away, we'll go back, we'll just slow, slow down, Chris. Slow down. So do you know when he's hit you? Yeah. Did you think to yourself, "Fuck me, that's yes, a bad one." Straight away. Because sometimes you don't. You, you get one and you think, well, "That was sore," and then you stand up and you think, "Oh, fucking, that was sore than what I thought." Straight away, you knew. And yeah, I that's could, a bad one. I couldn't stand up. I couldn't stand up. I, I, my, my impetus was taking me forward, and he shoved my leg. So part of my leg was still going forward, and the bit just below my knee went backwards. Hence. You know, I knew, and when I when I landed on my back, I, I I couldn't even I couldn't put my leg down. I I just sort of held it in mid air because I knew there was a problem. Gary Walsh, who was in our who was in our goal at the time, um, he 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 heard the the well basically the cruciate snap because mm -hmm. there was no damage to my shin pad. Jesus. So that's uh, and people in the stands heard it. Well, Chris Casper was in the stands as well. Uh, he was injured, so otherwise he would have been playing in the game, and and he he heard it. And straight away, my mum and dad, who was sitting a few rows in front of the manager, he, he shouted my dad and he grabbed him and hauled, hauled him downstairs to to uh, to the changing room area because he knew that there was a, a big problem. Was, was Ferguson, am I right, in saying he was straight away, we were taking action about this? Yes. Like civil action? Yeah. He was adamant that he didn't feel as though, um, having seen the tackle and the fact that we were... Uh, MUTV wasn't up and running then, but they were they were trialing, videoing reserve yeah. games, and that's obviously where the video came from because we had video evidence as well. And he was adamant that they they weren't to get away with it. Yeah, yeah. As a club or as a club, as a club. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they sued Blackburn Rovers. Was this straight after? Like, had you got the results from your? No, from, it, 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 it wasn't. Few weeks? It wasn't straight away. But it, he, in the time that I was recuperating, he consulted the club's lawyers, showed him the video, and he, he was adamant that 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 was what he wanted to do. That he didn't feel as though, um, and obviously at this stage we didn't know what the outcome was going to be. But it was a bad injury and a bad tackle, and um, and they knew that there was something that needed to be done about that because it, it, it was... Um, I, I haven't got any malice towards the guy who did it. I have no malice towards him whatsoever. That that bit of me that, you know, was festering for a while has, 
has has left me. Have you but seen him since? I, I I saw him once a couple of years later when we we played again another reserve game at Old Trafford, uh, but he he played centre half this time and we didn't we never came into contact. But that's the only time that I'd, I've ever seen or heard of him heard of him since. since. And you obviously won the 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 court battle. The court yeah, thing. we we. It, <sighs> I didn't want to drag it out. I mean, it'd been going on a long time, and I mean a real long time. Uh, and it was, I mean, that the tackle happened in 94, and it was done when Steve Bruce was my manager at Uddersfield in 99. So it was oh, nearly God. five Jesus. years. Jesus. It had gone on for a long, long time. And, and obviously expensive as well. Yeah. That I, I wasn't footing the bill for, but the club were. And, you know, even though you, you win, it still costs money. Lawyers cost a lot of money. Mm. Uh, yeah. uh, but was, I was grateful to him. Yeah. Really grateful. Where was your head at during the rehab? You know, did, did you did you think I'm going to get back? Did you still think I'm going to get back and be as better if, it, well, sorry, as good or if not as better than than I was before? Did you still think I can I can do it? The, the determination was there, but I think it quickly became apparent when I was when I started playing again that there was something missing. Yeah. I imagine you've always got that confidence and your first real bad injury. I'd look, you'd like to see anybody experience that straight away. Oh, I'll forget, come back. Forget, I'm fine. As well, I mean, forget as well, this is 25 years ago. Yeah. yeah. So rehab and operations and, and all that is totally different level now to what it were back then. We're talking rehab in 25 years mm. ago when people knew what they were doing, I expect, but not to the extent that they do now. Where if it happened tomorrow and you're in the same situation, you might come back and a lot, get a lot closer to where you, where you actually were. A lot were. sooner, yeah, a lot sooner. Well, medical science is evolving all the time, so you, exactly what you said, John, 25 years ago. I mean, you think 25 years ago, it was when Niall Quinn had just done his, Alan Shearer had just done his, uh, and obviously the, the one that everybody remembers was was Gaza when he mm. did it in the semi-final against, against Notts Forest. Um, and... You know, other than that, you didn't really hear of a lot no. of cruciate knee ligament injuries. They were not a lot of the, the more high profile ones. Paul Lake, I suppose, was another one who had a bad injury in, and his was just because they went in so many times that yeah. his knee was just shot at with, with wear and tear. Um, because he would have been somebody else that you probably would have heard a lot more about and yeah, on the plate on the plane. Uh, physio at uh, at Macclesfield. Right. And I heard that he were fucking outrageous. Yeah. Yes. Like, very, very good player. Top, top outrageous. Yeah. Yeah, he was. So it just goes to show that an injury like that happening at that time. I mean, Shearer and I suppose now Quinn as well were were, were examples of players that did come back mm. better. Um, but I didn't. Mm. <laughs> just one of them things. <laughs> you know, I, I was I was a player that, that uh, I mean, neither of those two uh, that we just mentioned, as, as tremendous a striker as Shearer was, he wasn't renowned for being lightning quick, and certainly now Quinn, we all know, wasn't. Mm. Uh, but my game, at, 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 at the one that I'd adapted to, was 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 with pace. I had two decent feet, and I was quick. Um, and when that gets taken away from you, it's uh, it has a, a tremendous impact on on what you're able to do. And when you think that playing at the elite level. The margins are so fine. I mean, don't get me wrong. I wasn't a car horse after I'd finished pl- after I'd finished me me rehab and I got back playing. But the half yard in the Premier League, which exactly, and that's what you need when you're at the yeah. top like that is to have that that half yard that you you lose a little bit of anything that made you what a, a really really good player. If you lose a little bit of that, then you don't have the same impact. Did uh, did Giggs play in the semi final? Yes, I think he did, did in he? the end. Yeah, I think he did. I can't remember because I never watched it. Yeah. yeah. I never watched it. No, I didn't watch it. I, pr- I think that's probably the only game that I, I've actually turned around and I said to myself, do you know what? I I don't want to see not that. Not interested in, no, in watching not, it. Yeah, I, I obviously wanted him to do well, but <coughs> no, it, it was just too, at the time, it was just too devastating yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah. How long were you out? In oh, total? I played my first game again in the November, but I was nowhere near. I would probably say that it was, um, it was getting myself back in the 95-96 season when I went on loan to Stockport and then I went on loan to Huddersfield mm-hmm. and that was when I really started to, to feel as though, do you know what, I'm, I'm probably not as not quite as affected as, as I once thought I, I, I was when, when I first came back um, in the, the end of the, the year that I did it in 94. 
So I went right the way through that. I wasn't and a, a decent pre season in the in, in the ninety five, ninety six season and that's when Sir Alex said to me, you know, it might be beneficial if you if you go on loan. It's you know, Bex had been, Keith Gillespie had been, uh, Chris Casper had been, and a few of them that had been out on loan and really benefited from it. So I did exactly the same thing and uh, I came back from Stockport and um and he said I, I think you you know you can you can go a little bit higher. Huddersfield Town are interested, and Brian Orton was the manager at Huddersfield at the time. And I had uh, I finished off from January to the end of the season with him playing in the you know what was the Championship back then, um, and that got me recognition. And I played for England under twenty ones in that summer in the uh, in the Toulon tournament, and Bex played in that. So we played together in that, which was brilliant. And and that's when I thought to myself, yeah, I, I I'm getting back to. To whether I reach it or not and obviously I didn't but I thought this is has given me a major boost and I wanted to sign for Huddersfield at that time but the manager um, I probably let my heart rule my head and I stayed for another two seasons when really I could have been playing league football you know two years before I did mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. so you kind of just accepted that you might not reach that level but it's still a championship's a yeah. very getting, good I'm, level I'm, isn't it I'm getting to a level where I'm Comfortable, comfortable. Like, yeah, I can co- I can handle play, being a championship player, sort of thing. Yeah, and I and I I, I know I, what could have been, but I can handle being a championship player. And, and at if that that's... point, you weren't thinking that. You were thinking, I, I've still, you know, that that ambition in your own head. And oh, you've going back to I want to. Yeah, you know, you're at Man United. I can still do it. I could, maybe I can still do it. Yeah, and... and I suppose that's a fucking really hard thing to admit. You know, I'm gonna to go to Huddersfield and play in play in the championship, but could I still do it? Well, it was at the time when, believe it or not, when England were was struggling for a left sided play and they kept sticking Scolzi out there. And Scolzi actually refers to it in the book. Um and I, I did an interview and I can't remember who the the interview was with at the Malmaison in, in Manchester, near the train station. Uh and because my start to my Huddersfield Town career permanently in 1998 had gone really well, and we were at the top of the league with Sunderland, funnily enough, when uh, um, uh, who who would have been playing at the time? What sort of Alan Johnson? Yeah, uh, Summerby and Buzz, that. Buzzy, yeah, Buzzy, uh, Chris Making. Um, and we just played him at, um, at the McAlpine as it was then, and we we drawn one apiece, and we were both sitting at the top of the league. And it sort of commanded a little bit of attention from from the press that even though I'd left Man United, I was a left-sided player, things were going well. Would it be that unrealistic to think that a championship player, even though they're at the top of the league, could get himself into the England squad? Um, And (laughs) the moment that I did the interview about it and then there was perhaps a possibility that I could have got myself back into the England squad, I broke my foot. I broke my foot in the October or the November of that year uh, and I was out for three or four months and never came back until the sort of late February. So it, I, I I didn't really hold out much hope anyway, but it was it was actually quite nice from the position that I, I found yeah. myself in, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, a couple of years yeah, before yeah. to actually being talked about perhaps because they're short of left-sided players to, to get, you know, a potential call up for... For the national team in yeah. uh, in 1998 after the World Cup, so but I mean that, that never came to fruition, and who knows? Even without the injury, it might not have happened. But I, I, another injury again couldn't have come at a worse time. Mm. I, I yeah. played at Birmingham, and uh, and Darren Purse of all people broke my foot. I want just to go back because I've just <laughs> got <laughs> it's unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> just timing, timing. And yes, of course, it's people. everything. Uh, it's absolutely everything. Yeah. Some people can go the whole careers without getting any injuries or any knocks or whatever. And then, any long term as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. You know, yeah. it's just. Yeah. How it happens. Yeah, yeah but listen. I'm still. I won't be here with you guys here. Will I? <laughs> <laughs> You'd have fucked us off, wouldn't yeah. you? Nah, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Under fucking what? Nah. <laughs> be buying his own club in MLS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sat on a beach in Malibu. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, um, <clears throat> did you um play with Adrian Doherty much? Because I've just got no. his book and that's a, yeah. that's a story. Yeah, that is a story. Uh, and again, a, a, you know, when you look at what happened with me, I mean, I'm I'm still here. 
Yeah. Um, it, what happened with with Adrian was was tragic, and you know, literally tragic, because he was again. I mean, he was a tremendous asset. He a didn't tremendous like football. Player. Am I right in saying that he just he wasn't interested? But he, he had this talent. He never he was he was talented. He, he never you you would never engage him in conversation about football because he was just clueless. Isn't the right word? Obviously, what he, he was uninterested. He, he was disinterested. Yeah. yeah, yeah, completely. He just what he was his interest was music. Yeah, he loved music. Am I right in saying he used to go he used to go busking? Busking in in. After training, yeah, he'd bring he'd his guitar busking. in and he'd go busking in the city centre. Just for the, just for the enjoyment, not that for were the, his passion. That was his passion was music, absolutely. So if he, if he got fifty pence or a tenner, he weren't bothered. He just wanted to go and he just that's what he wanted to do. He just loved music, yeah, with his guitar, <laughs> and uh, I, and it just so happened that he was a he was a brilliant footballer. Uh, and I didn't see him that often. He was a couple of years older than me, right. and I and I mean I'd heard a lot about him, but by the time we'd all got there, he was injured. Right. He'd already had the injury, um, which again was very, very similar to mine. Uh, but I, pff, I'm not really too sure what, as much as the club did, how how they managed to get through to him. Because anybody that ever knew Adrian, he he was he he was away in his own world. I think is the best way to to describe him. Um, and as as lovely a lad as he was, and he was a lovely guy. There wasn't a, an ounce of of malice in him. Um, he, he just you, you never knew whether whatever you were saying to him, he had such a vacant expression yeah. always on his face that you never knew that he, he it had sunk in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know things obviously went from from bad to worse with him, and uh, and he ended up taking his own life, which mm. is you know something that well, has never obviously with with what happened to me had never crossed my mind i felt low at times but yeah. never i mean i i often must wonder what what goes through people's heads that that they you know they feel the need to to end it all and it was a really really sad story from again somebody who who looked as though he had the the world at his feet and and would would go on and be a tremendous player and again it's 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 just timing and so it, bad it, he'd have rather have been an average musician than an incredible footballer I, do you know what? I'd probably, if you were to ever ask him that question or ever got the chance to ask him that question, I, I wouldn't hesitate to say that he would probably say, "Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd just my music is is what I really mm. love." It's mad that you can't get your head around that, can you? No, I can. No, I think if that's his passion. No, but I mean, you can't get your head around a footballer being so disinterested in football. Well, I don't know. You you don't seem to like it. <laughs> <laughs> easy target. Easy, easy target. But you know, I, I, I'm sure you you'd say I've come across players who are who are like coming to training and they just think, right, I'm coming, do me work and get off. Yeah. 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 Kenner. David Batty famously had he, he I think he's the only player who, who doesn't go back for the reunions for the uh, Blackburn winning squad. He's just. Not asked. Said he hated football. He was just good at it. You know. Strange, isn't it? Yeah. So the, I think it might have been Mick Rathbone saying. So he took his tie <laughs> off on a Saturday, two o'clock. That's when he used to switch on and what have you. His head was on the game. As soon as he put his tie back on, forget about it. Yeah. And yeah, just, did. That's sometimes a plus. Though. Yeah, I know. I mean, yeah. like, if if I've if I've got beat at quarter past five, I've forgot about it. Same as if if I've we've won and I've scored two, quarter past five I forgot about it, and that can be a good thing I think because I've known players who go home and f don't sleep on a Saturday night right. and yeah 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 and are, like thinking oh fucking I've I've had a I've had a nightmare mm. and ruins all, your whole weekend. I think that's just people in general, isn't it? No matter what industry you're in, some people go and do a job and they're happy just getting the wage at the end of the week and spend, go out at weekend and spend the money. Some people. Completely immerse yeah, yourself in the work. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's very true. Which yeah. where are you on this spectrum? <laughs> Mate, we're, just we're, keep bobbing about. <laughs> just dip your toe in here and there. Yeah. Yeah. Just bit, bit here, bit there. <laughs> Have you seen him give any bollockins, Ferguson? I saw him give one to Nicky Butt in the when Monaco knocked us out of the Champions League in '97. He just hammered him. Full of dry treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Was it because he was playing shit or was there something else? He had given the ball away and then there was like, so much went on before Trezeguet picked up the ball and smashed it in the roof of the net. 
and it was early doors as well so there was plenty of time for us to come back from it um, and we did it he stayed at 1-0 and we'd drawn the first leg 0-0 in Monaco and he just went at half time he went absolutely mental at him that's the only one that I've ever seen. I know there's been a, a lot more, but I just it stuck in my mind because I was actually sitting next to Bunny mm. at the time. I was on the bench and obviously he was playing. What but, kind of stuff was that? Because I always think sometimes it can be a build-up of thing. You know, like bef- managers are probably the same with me and you. I think it's something not right with him. He's, he's took his foot off the gas a little bit. The next time I've got an excuse to have a pop, I'm going to jump on it. So it, like you say, he'd give the ball away. The, 10 phases of play later the, the score I think, but it was at summit before no there was nothing I think what it is he he used to put as did Roy Keane when we were training he used to put so much emphasis especially when we were playing in Europe about not giving the ball away so the lead up to that game from like the Sunday after the game on the Saturday whatever it was so you're in on on Sunday you're in Monday and then you're in again on Tuesday before the games Wednesday and everything is just possession, possession, but I don't give the ball away. Whether you're in, you know, you're in your little, you know, boxes with two in the middle, or whether we're actually playing a, a, like a practice match type thing for 20 minutes, whatever it is, just don't give the ball away. And that will have been what stuck in the manager's mind that it was him that gave the ball away. United couldn't then get it back before it got to Trez again. He smashed it in the net. So that's what will have stuck in his mind. Not the fact that he he he, he, he was directly his fault that the goal was scored, but it, it was the it was the giving away of possession that that yeah. started it. And the, the emphasis, like I said, was on it all the time and Keeney would just have a pop at you if you give the ball away in training it just shows you the, the levels how that next step like it, it's in the championship and stuff if you give the ball away the manager will say, you know it's happened people make mistakes you know but that level him I'd, saying don't give the ball away it's like you get punished oh, every training session I've been shit with <laughs> you get punished yeah, yeah. You get pun- and, we, and we did yeah was we there did. a fear? no there was no fear I mean, because everybody... I mean, even Keeney give the ball away, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but yeah. Would Keeney get a bollocking for giving, giving he, he everybody... Would, he, would be the f- he would be the first to hold his hands up and apologise for giving the ball right. away. But nobody really had a pop at him because it was rare. It was rare that he gave the ball mm. away and he was such a tremendous player and such a, a great sort of driving force that, you know, if, if he did give the ball away occasionally, then... You know, you just let him get on with it. It's not the aftermath is not worth just having a pop at him saying, Roy, what are you playing at? So it's not worth it. It's just, it's it's just, just not, not worth, worth it. it. No, it's not worth it. And well, like I said, it happened rarely anyway. Do you know, do you know the bollocking? I mean, obviously you mentioned Brian Orton and I, I played for Brian. At, oh, he at, gave me, I've got one for you, Isabel. Uh, and he just used to stare at you. That's you it. You fucking cunt. The stare. Yeah. You'll have to mark to believe that you. But then he, you, 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 you fucking cunt. Right? <laughs> and then he'd go on to someone else, and you, you fucking. <laughs> what? Nothing constructive. Not really. No. 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 Right. Then, All you know then, is that you're a cunt. Yeah. And then he'd have, <laughs> he'd have a minute on him, and then if he caught your eye again, you fucking cunt. And he'd come back at you. It'd be three or four times in a in an halftime bollocking like. So what were Fergus? Were he actually? Was it constructive? Or, yeah. Yeah, no, he, he 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 would. I mean, you knew why he was having a go at you, but a little bit like Brian Orton, who I've had a bollocking from as well. Uh, when I was on, when I was on loan up at Sunderland the first time, sorry, up at Huddersfield, we played up at Sunderland, and um, and I mean we weren't we'd sort of fallen away a little bit, but Sunderland were doing really well, and it was just at the time that Bridgie was emerging, Michael Bridges, and we were 1-1 one, one at half time we were playing really well and I'd been kicked a buggery off this I think he was Polish Darius Kibicki you know him mm. right so he, he <laughs> great knowledge so great. Fun, he, he kicked me to buggery honestly and um, and I was getting no protection whatsoever and the referee at the time who went on to referee in the Premier League was Neil Barry mm. uh, he was a little Hitler as well he was uh, anyway I, uh, I'd already been booked for, for overreacting to uh, being kicked for the umpteen time. Anyway, just before the half-time whistle went, um, I'd skip past Kibiki and he fucking shoved me right up in the air. And uh, and the ball had 
ricocheted off somebody and the ball had gone in the air as well and it would, I just happened to get to my feet when the ball landed in my hands and he blew the half-time whistle and out of nowhere just just missed the red came over me <laughs> and as he held his arms out for me to throw the ball to him I just fucking launched it straight in his face <laughs> the ref straight in the ref face I was Can't. that in, I was that incensed he couldn't get it out quick enough and that was me so we come back we went back down into the tunnel I thought oh no what have I done and we were 1-1 we were doing really well and um, and he just said, he said to me, Brian Hart, and he went, what are you playing at? He said, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> and you got it, it lying, and idiot. It stopped, and it stopped there. But don't forget, I was only on loan, so he didn't go to town yeah. on me. Well, not as I thought. Anyway, we went back out, and obviously I'm sitting in the changing room, mulling over well, what's going to happen now, because Sunderland were doing well. We went 2-1 up. Marcus Stewart scored. We went 2 1 up, and I thought, brilliant. So I made my way up into the stands. <laughs> the lad, the They're going to get me out of this. this. They're going to get me out of it. And I'm looking at my watch, and with about eight minutes to go, they brought Michael Bridges on. He scored twice. I <laughs> He scored twice in the last 10 minutes of, of coming on. And it, I think it was, it must have been either his debut or it, it wasn't long after. He was only 18, 17, 18. And, uh, and he scored twice. And we got back down to the dressing rooms and a little bit like you, he, he went round and it, at the end of it all, and he just went, anyway, he said, forget what I've just said to you. And I'm sitting in the corner like that. And he went, you can blame that fucking knobhead over there. <laughs> And that's what he did. He said, every single one of you, look at that dickhead sitting in the corner. It's his fucking fault. Public humiliation. And that, and that was it. And, and, you know, because, and I'm trying to endear myself to these lads, do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm here on loan and they probably think, oh, here he is. You know, Billy Big Bollocks coming from Man United. And, uh, and I went and got myself sent off. And I, and I watched it again and I just thought, Ben, what on earth are you doing? He just got he, his he had, piercing eyes, oh, anyway. He did, and he oh. just, yeah. And, uh, and at the end of the season, we were playing... Portsmouth and I mean played against Portsmouth they've got proper good travelling support yeah. Portsmouth and we were playing against them and they had to beat us to step we, we were yeah, it was a nothing game for us we couldn't do anything we weren't going to go down and we weren't in the playoffs or anything like that but they needed to win to stay in the division and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and for the second time that sort of red mist I put it down to Sunderland but it had made its way through Scotch Corner and ended up <laughs> and ended up in Yorkshire <laughs> and, it hit, and it hit me again and this time I just swung for the nearest person not my fist but my I just turned out and I booted the nearest person it was Fitzroy Simpson and the referee saw it straight away. Red card, bang, <laughs> straight down the tunnel. And that was when I got the glare. And it was the it was the Christmas the Christmas. It was the end of season do straight after oh, the night. game. So my missus who'd come to the game because she was coming with me. Um, I got there later on, and he was he was obviously there was there was no uh, there was no afterwards with it. But he turned to my missus and he says, "Can you get a grip of him?" He said, "The lad's a really good player." but he's a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> he said, and I, and I tell you what, I got, a, and even, and that was one of the times that I did get a bollocking from the manager. Not the first time, but the second time from Sir Alex Ferguson when I'd, um, when I got sent, I got off, sent again. off again. Yeah. yeah, he went absolutely nuts, yeah. Did he ring you up? No, he, he brought me in. He brought me in in the close season. Oh God. <laughs> so did you get a phone call saying, Ben, I want you to come and see me? Um, Brian, Brian Kidd said the manager wants you to go in and see him. Did you know that? Anyway, he said he, he said he wants to know how you felt your loan spell had gone, but he said I think we both know that your second sending off has not gone down too well. <laughs> I fucking knew it. I knew it. But fortunately, started off with a bollocking, and then it and I, and I managed to produce this letter as well to say that I'd been called up for the. The under twenty one, so I was all right. Just soften him up a little, <laughs> a little bit, bit, just a little bit. But he didn't. He still fined me two weeks' wages Oof. on both occasions. Oh Jesus! <laughs> on both occasions, but he you let the first one go. Check, didn't you? I know he let the first one go, but the second one, he said, "I'm not having that." He said, "He said you, you need to calm yourself." Down. <laughs> Did you, um, you have any nights out with Stewie, Marcus Stewart? I had a few. Yeah, I was with him when um, 
we played down at Palace and that was his last game and I was and he was I, I was we were having a night out in Croydon for whatever reason and uh, and he stayed down and the next day I had to take him here there and everywhere because he was getting his move to Ipswich he once um, I don't know if I've spoken about it before he once went to Magaluf for a month during the off off season a month he just kept extending his stay I've done kept three missing 20, that fly. I think it was like 23 days or something I, I don't know if he was married or, or someone at the time or just split up yeah he, he probably, came back his skin was like leather <laughs> but man, he's 32 at this point <laughs> <laughs> he just I, I mean to be fair him, he, 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 I don't think he drinks anymore I think he I don't know if he was fighting it back then or what he's into his bike and stuff now but at the time he was he was out quite a bit and but yeah, he came back and he still fit as a fiddle. I don't know if you remember how fit he was, but oh yeah, and I, there was nothing could, to him, was nah. there, Stewie? He was he was eight stone wet through. There was nothing to him. It's a long old trip that three weeks yeah. in Magaluf, isn't it? Not so bad. Jesus, I, yeah, he, he, I think he's gone down the biking route. He goes biking and that now. And oh, we will soon. Yeah. He's still yeah, rambling. He still lives. He lives. I think him, him and Maisie's kids got the same school. Do they? I think he I, was a Bristol Rovers assistant manager, but I don't know if he's if he left with uh, Daryl Clark. Yeah, it was That's a choice what? between that and an 1830s rep. <laughs> <laughs> you can't quite decide. Yeah, it's been and gone. It's gone there. Oh, what yeah. was it? He's still trying to get on. No, it's, been, it's, it's they don't they don't do it anymore. No, they don't do it anymore. Fucking do killed us. No. You can get on if you're over 30. Believe you or me. Can you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the only time you've got a fake a fake ID <laughs> yeah. for younger than 30. Stewie was good fun though. Yeah, he was brilliant. Stu was good fun. He was a good player as well, but he was real good fun. He was great to have in the dressing room. He always looked after the young lads at Sunderland and that. You know, on about Robson, Stu exactly the same. Young lads coming through, he'd always take time and have nice a crack lad. with you in that. No, he's a nice lad, good lad. His accent used to make me laugh. Was um, he used to do? He used to do think in the dressing room, talking about, and he he, he used to sit there, right, and and he'd sort of sit there with nothing on. <laughs> and, he, and he'd pretend to wrap a piece of string around his knob. If <laughs> 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 you ever see him getting to do it, it was funny as fuck. It, 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 was re- it was really funny. And he, he, he used to love it. That and he used to, he used to get people coming through, watch this. He used to get <laughs> coming into training, watch this. And he used to wrap this pretend piece of string. <laughs> it was funny. He used to have us in stitches with it. He didn't care. Like a thunderbird. Yeah, he was funny. <laughs> He was a good lad, he was great value, Stewie, I liked him. <coughs> <coughs> Aberdeen then, after mm. Huddersfield. Was there other offers? That was, um, there was actually, I was, uh, I was trained, I, I'd, I'd finished that season when I, when I left Huddersfield and, uh, and I'd been invited by Alan Pardew, who was the manager at Reading at the time, this was 2001. Um, and he had Martin Allen as his assistant, who was a nutcase. Yeah. But I liked him. I did like because he he was. I actually felt as though he was he was really really genuine. I like Martin Allen. I mean I know he's not everybody's cup of tea, but I really liked him. Um, and Alan Pardew sort of got me there for a two week sort of training thing. And I know he had his eye on a lad called Alex Smith, who was, at, I think he was at Rotherham at the time. He'd been at Everton. Um, and I know that he was his first choice, but he got me on this, this two-week training thing. Um, and at the end of it, he said, I'm going to have to speak to my chairman, blah, blah, blah. And because uh, I still don't know what's happening with, with Alex Smith. He's my, you know, he's my number one target. Anyway, in the meantime, I got home um, we played a game against Charlton, which was the last, this was like the culmination of these two weeks that I'd spent there. And I got myself back. And I, I, the moment I got back on the Friday night, I got a phone call uh, and it was the it was the scout at Aberdeen, the chief scout. And he said, oh, I believe that you, you're you looking for a club at the moment. And I said, yeah, I've just done two weeks with Reading. Uh, and he said, oh, have you signed for him? And I said, well, no, and I, I don't know where I'm at with it. He said, why don't you come up to, he said, why don't you come up to Aberdeen tomorrow? He said, "We'll fly you up, um, have a couple of days training. We'll play a practice match. Watch that they, you know, their season kicks off." Mm. So this was like it was like I remember it was the 29th of July, and this was the 28th, and their first game was against Rangers at home on the Saturday. So he said, "We'll fly you up in the morning, 
Jim Layton picked me up from the airport, who I, who I didn't know from United before, even mm. though obviously he'd spent a lot of time there, I'd seen a lot of him. He was, an, he was a great fellow as well. Uh, he picked me up from the airport, took me to my hotel. It was, it was actually a little bit like this. <laughs> it was honestly <laughs> it reminded me all about this a, cl- a, cl- a classy uh, establishment it was, is that it was what you're great. trying to say yeah so <laughs> Palty Towers um, I uh, I went to the game and then we trained on the Sunday morning trained on the Monday and then on the Tuesday we had a game at I think it was like Breakin or somewhere like that I forget I, anyway it was one of them little Breakin or Forfar or somewhere like one that little shitty Scottish team yeah I can't remember <laughs> where it was um, anyway there was another there was another guy on loan uh, not on loan who was on trial um, and he he was from France and he was called Lionel Pratt honestly and we won the game I think we won the game 2-0 and I scored both goals and actually I was so glad to have scored both goals because after an hour we me obviously doing very very little mm. I'd had only a couple of weeks but playing a game as you know is yeah, totally different totally. and I was breathing out my ass. and the last thing that I did was win us a penalty and this lad was having a torrid <laughs> and the ball he ended up putting it in the river behind. <laughs> took, this, took this penalty. <laughs> didn't, yeah. didn't, didn't so, get so the headline the next day, you can imagine what the headline was in the local paper. <laughs> what a fucking prat. Yeah. <laughs> prat. <laughs> so anyway, on the on the back of it, um, I mean, the, it's amazing because the manager was a Danish guy called Ebi Skovdal and he was a strange bloke. I mean, he never even went to the game. It was a bit odd. So you're sort of <laughs> I'm on trial, trial game. two trial games, and he, he never went to the game. <laughs> but um, his assistant manager went, and a couple of other members of his staff, and uh, and he he pulled me in the next morning, and he said, uh, "We after the way you played yesterday, um, we we've, we would like to offer you a two year contract." So I just thought, right, and uh, how old were you at this point? Uh, what would it have been in two thousand and one? It was twenty twenty six. I was twenty six. And about three days later, um, Alan Pardew phoned and he said, um, have, you, have you signed for anybody? I said, yeah, about three days ago, I signed for Aberdeen. And he said, uh, he said right, because um, Alex Smith is messing us about, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and I'm not going to sign him now, but I'd like to sign you. I said, well, unfortunately, you're too late. I've met someone, time 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 met someone again, lucky it? people in my time, so Ben, but <laughs> you're up there. Isn't it? <laughs> you're up there. Yeah. But I, don't get me wrong, I loved my time at Aberdeen. Yeah. I mean, I, I met a girl up there who is my, my son's mum, who we're not together anymore. But, I mean, things like that would, you know... For me, would never have never have know, would never have come about. I made some really good friends. Um, do you know David Priest? Yeah, Priest, yeah. <laughs> so Priest's Priest was my goalkeeper up there, and uh, and we had a night out. We had a night out up there once. There was just me and him. Um, more than one occasion, but on this particular occasion, he just got himself back into the team. So Jim Layton was the was the goalkeeping coach, and the, it was always between Preece and a lad called Ryan Essen, who went on and played quite a lot of games for Inverness Cali afterwards. Anyway, Ryan got injured, and Preece was back into the team, and it was a bit like tit for tat, whoever was going to be in. Uh, and it was his turn, and he'd had four or five games, and we were doing really well at the time. And we thought we we had a night out, and it was just me and him at the end, and we were absolutely mortal and we were on this and I can't remember the name of this road but it, it's it's like their equivalent of St John Street in Manchester or Harley Street in London but these buildings it's all going on these buildings in Aberdeen are like all granite and they're, all, they're massive big huge lovely buildings and they've all got their signs outside with the name of whatever business is in there in marble on a on like a slab so anyway we were messing about and, uh, and Preece pulled one of these marble slabs onto his foot and broke his foot. He just got, <laughs> just got back in the team. And we had to phone the physio the next day, who also happened to be somebody that came out with us quite a lot, um, and just say, uh, and say, listen, um, we've... <laughs> 
we were at, we were at Priest's last night and we were moving some furniture and he just <laughs> <laughs> he was like you're having a laugh and he said I'll, he said come in tomorrow morning but only if you're prepared to tell me the truth yeah. about what happened and to this day well not now obviously but to this day there's only me Priest and John Sharp who was the physio at the time who, who knew what had happened and he was absolutely gutted Priest he was gutted it was nobody's fault but his own uh, did you do well at that? strange cat First season, brilliant. We, um, I, I was in a team. I was scoring goals. Um, we qualified for the UEFA Cup after in our first season, and then in the second season, for whatever reason, things changed, and he would on, he would only play me in the home games. He wouldn't play me in away games, and it it, it just got to the stage where I thought. I, I can't keep doing this and Aberdeen is a small place and you very very quickly get attracted and attached to going out a reputation <laughs> and you have to be so careful because it is a village even mm. though it's a city it's a, it's a village and I was out I was on my own up there um, I was out all the time and if I wasn't out I was having but there were people around I was having parties and it, it was yeah it very quickly descended into just a bit of a piss bl- up a bit of a blur yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why, a why blur. was that do you think did you do it at Huddersfield and no the other cl- what didn't was, do, I changed? didn't do that at Huddersfield I think it was probably because segregation I, I was on my own mm. yeah I was on my own and I didn't have I didn't have like you know my mum and dad or I didn't have any of my, my close mates sort of you know saying hey you know you need to rain keep an eye on what you do yeah rain it in exactly not just that I imagine distraction if your mates are, are there to, to go and do something else Exactly, exactly. And you're stuck on your own and, and there's always somebody, even if it's not one of your teammates, there's always somebody who's like, you know, do you, fancy, do you fancy a few beers? <laughs> and when you go out, I, I mean, I, I'm all or nothing. So I'm not one of these who say, yeah, I'll come out, I'll have a couple and I'll go home. I either but I won't bother or I'll be there until they're ringing the bell or the, fucking, <laughs> or the cleaners come in with the Uber type thing. <laughs> and that's what I was like when I was up there. And, and yeah, it quickly descended into a bit of a farce, really. Ever honestly. Thursday, Fridays, before the game on the Saturday? Um, yeah. I don't recall ever doing it. I don't recall ever doing it on a Friday. I definitely did it on a Wednesday on more than one occasion. I'm, I might have done it on a Thursday, but again, you had to be so, so careful mm. because uh, I remember, and Priestley was involved again, it was just before Christmas, and we, we'd been out uh, the goalkeeper was having a bit of a meal with the missus and what have you and me and, and, and I can't remember who the other lad was anyway it, it might have been Robbie Winters or somebody like that and we'd gone out uh, and we met up with the goalkeepers and we ended up and we were playing Celtic on the Saturday and this was a Wednesday night and the manager had already said I don't want anybody going out uh, and he allowed the goalkeepers to have a little because he was only going out for a meal and they were taking the missus with him but uh, some of us had a bit of a breakaway Precy included and, uh, and we ended up, God knows what time in the morning, coming into training the next day, trying to mask it. Um, and <laughs> pl- Preacy playing at this point? Preacy was Are you playing, playing yeah, as well? I'm playing as well. We're all playing. <laughs> we're all playing <laughs> and we're playing Celtic as well. <laughs> so it did, it, you're going to get beat anyway, <laughs> weren't you? You know what I mean? Back then, you're going to get beat. So um, <laughs> we're just about to go out to training and uh, and we got a, we got a message <clears> from uh, one of... One of the managers, he, the lad, he, he sort of sort of ran around and like a bit of a dog body, body type thing, yeah. And he said the manager wants to see you, so we went in, and there was me pre. I think it was Robbie Winters. There was three of us. We went in and we said, um, "Where were you? On, where were you last night? Where were you last night?" And pre said, "Like Mister, I'll look after myself." Well, I was out with the goalkeepers and my missus, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I said. Well, me and Robbie were, you know, a bit of a loose end, so we just went and met him. Oh, well, we've got, um, we've had reports of a, an email here saying that you were out until um, such and such a time dancing on dancing on tables <laughs> in some bar or another. Well, I said it couldn't have been us. There's no chance. <laughs> well, we've got this email here, and he, he said time will tell. He didn't say, you know, I'm going to go check in CCTV or anything. He said, I just want you to be honest with me, was it you? We, we both just went, no, it wasn't us. <laughs> we did go out, but, you know, we we were home at a reasonable time. We just went and met Jim and, and Priestley and the goalkeepers and what have you. Right, OK, then. So we're all in a team on the Saturday. Anyway, we beat Celtic 2-0. 
the only time in my two years that I ever got a result against the old firm home or away and we beat Celtic 2-0 and uh, and the same guy who had wrote this email and by the way the email was like ranting and raving about you know we're you know full on Aberdeen fans Aberdeen and, fan, and yeah. we're seeing you know we're seeing these players going out and you know drinking when we've got one of our biggest games of the season at the weekend the same guy on the Monday morning sent an email in saying listen tell them they can go out whenever they want <laughs> 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 all is you'll forgiven hear, you'll hear no complaints from me get the lads out absolutely <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> but that's how small a place Aberdeen was that you 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 needed to be very very careful mm. both who you were with and especially where you were because it, very <laughs> more often than not wherever you went there would be Aberdeen fans that get back would, to the club be, yeah some of them embraced it and were you know really happy to see you and you know realize that you're human as well and you were but there was there was others of them that just thought well there's no way that she'll be here and I'm writing a message uh, you know, I'm getting in touch with the club and saying they're being unprofessional yeah, and all we've that. We spoke about it before. It depends on how the team's doing and all. If they're winning, no, well, yeah, people turn case. a blind eye. Yeah, yeah. That's your perfect case scenario. Yeah, really. yeah. So you enjoyed your time in Aberdeen. Loved it. Probably a bit too much. <laughs> it sounds as though yeah. it sounds like you were enjoying it. I know there's an element of the book where you you enjoy about you talk about a particular night out. Yeah, I know. At the yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I did. Yeah, <laughs> so I silence. I know, but I, I can't. I, the, the only thing is, I can't. Um, I can't divulge as I didn't in the book. I can't tell you who it was with. I can't tell you who it was. We'll with. just have him as Mister Big. I mean, you've not. You've not. <laughs> have you not read the book? So you don't. I'm, a, I, no. I'm not a big reader. Mister. Uh, yeah. Mr. Big, yeah, that'll do. Is that off Sex and the City? I'm sure it's off Sex and the City. You watch Sex and the City? Sex and the City fan, I didn't know you was. Mrs. has got it on box set, hasn't she? Yeah, that was a, yeah, that was a, a it's the only time it's ever happened. It's the only time it's ever happened, and it's, it's a strange scenario if you've ever been in it. I don't know what, I don't, I don't, I don't know what the scenario is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. See, yeah. I knew we'd get onto shagging eventually. <laughs> yeah. whether, whether you're one with two or whether you're a two with one, it's a, it's a strange scenario. I couldn't, honestly couldn't tell you. No, it's the only time it's ever happened to me as well. It's the only time it's happened. And I, I think, I, would I prefer it to be with two members of the opposite sex or was I, was I happy that I had somebody else there with me and we had a... Bit of encouragement. We had a good laugh. Yeah. To that. I, I, I don't know because it'll never happen again. So <laughs> uh, I, I can't compare it to anything. It would have been nice for me to give it a go. Were you high-fiving? I think we did at one point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had to take a laughing break and all that. <laughs> You went, you went like that with your towel, you said, Dad, you're just sweating. We had to take a laughing break. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was. It was uh... were, all, were all three of you laughing? Was yes. she laughing as well? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I was hoping that she was laughing at the same things we were. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it's all yeah, no, partly growing up. It was good. It, it, I'm saying it was good fun. <laughs> it was good fun. It, it was, was good. good fun. Yeah, and then he, and then he, um, he obviously he sort of went home. And uh, and I carried on. I've had I've had enough. Uh, yeah, I've had enough. Couldn't yeah. perform. What, he tapped laugh. out. He tapped done. out. Yeah. Left you on your own. Yeah, le- and then he left me on my own. Yeah. Yeah. Then were the days, eh? Yes. No, not for me. I'm just saying, when you were younger and you did like lads did stuff yeah. like that. I, up in Aberdeen, I uh, I was for a <laughs> for a couple of months when I first got up there and I bought my flat. I ended up moving a stripper in. <laughs> and then, and just then really dancing, I, dancing on the table at that time, and then, and then, re- then realised that my mum and dad were coming up for Christmas, and I needed to get rid of her, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know how to do it. I just had to be horrible to her because she wasn't going anywhere. So is she going to start claiming squatters' rights? Oh my I'm in. God, I'm she, in. This is my house. I had two cars up there. She, she took. She had. She ended up with one of me. Ca- didn't take it, but in the time that she was living with me, she, she used to go around in in, my, in one of my cars, <laughs> and it was getting far too like serious. And I just I, and I needed to say, listen, you know, I, I, I need to call it a day. So was she was she going to your car in your car to work? Yes. <laughs> it, it'll cost you lesson tips. Going yeah. in, going and putting. <laughs> A fanny in people's faces and coming back to you. Yes. In your car. Yeah. 
But that's I, I, at first I, I, I never thought anything of it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I thought I can't have a and and I can't have a girlfriend who's a stripper. <laughs> and I said my mum would just have kittens. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> if she was still there when they arrived at Christmas, and you know what? I thought your old man would have been all right, wouldn't it? Yeah, Christmas. Been loving I, it, yeah. Sat having Christmas dinner and she's on the table like that, and he's putting a sprout in. <laughs> To the grave, you know, when you like, come up, Dad, just fetch some five pound notes up with you. <laughs> I was definitely the source of uh, of, of many a, a, a good sort of dressing room there. I mean, Priestley himself, he said, I did, I did something with him. A, a, well, I can't remember. I thought you said it. I thought you said you weren't mentioning names. No, 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 no. no, no, no it's just something totally different. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is what like what we're doing now. Sorry, Priestley. What we're doing now, and, and he, he sort of. And before I came on, he, he actually introduced. He said, "There's two people in his career that he that actually brought a dressing room together." And he said, "One was Noel Whelan." when he went up there and he said the other one was me, which I thought was really nice. But I, when I look back and think about a lot of the stories that I had from like every weekend, basically, I would come back into training. We always had Mondays off. It was really strange and it was the worst thing ever for me <laughs> because we Sundays. could go Sundays, we were in for a warm down. So you could go out Saturday night, no either, and then all day, all day Sunday with Monday to recover. So I literally had like pretty much three week three weekends out of four, I would have thirty six hours out at a weekend. <laughs> what without you... any question. <laughs> so there was always a story on a Monday morning. Oh sorry, on a Tuesday morning when I got back. And very often a lot you know, quite a few of the lads had been with me anyway, but yeah, yeah. some of them were attached and I realised that they couldn't come out every mm. weekend, but for ones that couldn't there were ones that could and, yeah. and we used to have a bar we used to go out Saturday night roll in at God knows what time then it'd be somebody's turn to drive to work we'd go for a walk down the seafront have a bit of a rub shower and then we'd be straight in one of the seafront cafes if it was nice have something to eat breakfast and then we'd be out all day and in Aberdeen things were open till 2-3 in the morning even on a Sunday night it's a good session and it that, was it? legendary mm. And, uh, and then I wondered why I couldn't get myself in a team. <laughs> <laughs> but fuck it, fuck it, I'm having a good time. I did, I had a great time. And and, and there, there was some, uh, yeah, there was, there was some great banter in that dressing room and it was good. And I, I must admit, a lot of it was people listening to my exploits. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, is that good time what you see as you enjoyed it? You don't have any look back. You don't look back and think, "Oh, maybe I should have tried a bit harder." Oh, you think I, I've had a fucking good time. No, one. I, I do look look back now and think, "Yes, I did have a good time." And you know, doing the book and and sort of recounting some of these stories and some of these yeah. you know episodes that I've been through. Um, like you've no regrets, basically. I've no regrets whatsoever in in terms of I I have enjoyed meeting people all the way along the way. Um, I just, at that stage, when I realised that once Aberdeen was over, then I'd have been 28 and I was thinking, this is when really I should still be in your pump. somewhere near oh, my peak. Yeah, yeah, well, and I was miles away. And that was because... And I do, I do mention this in the book. Um, I say no regrets. That is a regret that I have got. Yeah. That on a like on a Saturday night, if I wanted to go and have a few beers, then nobody could argue about that. I played a game, go and you know, go and have a night out and what have you. But on the Sunday, why carry it on? Do you know what I mean? You, yeah. You're entitled to have a bit of a rest, but go and have a rest by, you know, they, they used to allow us to go and use a, a like a, a health club ne next to the, where the ground was. And I very often went in there for a sauna and what have you, but that was just to sweat all the alcohol out mm. of me. It wasn't it wasn't for me to, to get myself back on track to start, you know, perhaps even on the Monday, go and, you know, go and do a little bit by yourself in the gym sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, even have a swim, stretch, swim. Yeah, go and do that. But what I was doing on a Monday was what I should have been doing on a Sunday and that's recovering from alcohol. Do you think what happened previously with the injury played a part in that? I think it probably did. Um, I think this was me going from a time when... The coping mechanism. I was, yes, exactly right. Exactly right. It's a coping yeah. mechanism that, you know, I was on my own and the fact that I never, there was a good chance that I, I might never play football again, um, 
I I just thought that I was going to get well, just kick the ass out of it basically. Mm. But what I did was I I <laughs> sort of instead of kicking the ass out of actually playing football, I sort of tried to kick the ass out of playing football and also enjoying myself. Yeah. And the two just don't work. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of them has to give way. And if you're abusing your body like I was with drinking far too much and being out partying all the time, then you, there's no way that you, that however much you put into football, you, you're going to get what you w- mm. what you should be getting out of it because you're destroying it all by drinking. It's strange that you did that at 26, 27. You know, like if you had it, doing your rehab from when you were younger, mm. did you not do the same then? Or no. were you still? No, I didn't. I never, I never even thought because I mean, I, I went through a, 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 a a sort of group of friends that I've still got now, but where I was having to dedicate myself when I was like 15, 16 to actually becoming a professional footballer. Mm. That was when they would like, you know, pick up their first pint when they were 15, 16 type thing. And it it had no, no interest to me whatsoever. And, And I'm not saying that I didn't have a drink, but I didn't have one before I was 18. You know, I actually waited until the legal age before I could actually have a drink. And even then, it wasn't really, you know, it didn't really sort of register that it was anything that I really wanted to mm. do. Uh, the only thing I wanted to do was play football. But then the the older you get and the more... Um, the more opportunity you get to to sort of meet different people and and that have different mentalities and you end up going out for a drink here and going out for a drink there and where and no disrespect to the clubs that I went to where the professionalism isn't the same as it is yeah. at Manchester United Not as much scrutiny no, exactly and then you then you you sort of fall into that little bit of a trap that well you know it's all right. I'm training all the time I can go out and have a few beers but my problem was that I just I just went out all the time when I, that would have been a decent time for me to do it but I had probably again I had people looking over my shoulder when I was up in Aberdeen I was completely yeah. by myself I didn't have anybody saying hey you should be in bed you've got you know you're training tomorrow you've got a game in a couple of days it was like you know I'll, I'll do what I please and mm. I'll you know I'll I'll not shag who I like but you know I'll have anybody <laughs> I want back without any sounds, to, sounds like you could without, <laughs> without any without any without any any worry yeah. absolutely without any worry do you think without, I don't know, playing psychologist, if you will, that once you went through that recovery, that at that moment in time, even going to Huddersfield, you felt there was a chance that you could get back to your peak. And from being held in such high regard, mm. like we said, you know, quotes from Nobby Styles, David Beckham, etc., being kept, being held in that such high regard, even at Huddersfield, thinking that you could possibly reach your potential again, it was when you got to Aberdeen, that maybe you thought there was no chance once I got to Aberdeen there was no chance I realised that 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 first stint when I got to Huddersfield full time in 1998 when there was when I mentioned earlier about there was talk that it was potential for me to be called up to the England squad and then I broke my foot at Birmingham that after that had gone I I suddenly realised and then Huddersfield went on a downward spiral The, um, the guy that came in when Brucey took over um, was only in for a very short time got rid of all the, the, the money that he'd ploughed into it but still left players on big wages mm. uh, people like Chris Lucchetti Clyde Wynard Kenny Irons um, there, were, there was a, a, you know, a fairly sort of healthy list of players that were uh, back in you know, the, the late 90s were earning like you know, 250, 300 grand a year you know, they were on 6, 7 grand a week and there was more than one of them yeah. And it was a lot of money, and they and they couldn't sustain it, and and it would have been okay if the team was was successful. But after the, my first two seasons, it suddenly became apparent that without the money there uh, to to go out and buy more players, we were we were falling further and further behind. And and I knew that I, I was it. I had to get out basically if I was going to take my career any further. Um, but by that time. I mean, I, I, I would imagine that uh, maybe if I'd have gone to Reading, yeah. it might have been different. But I think you're up in Aberdeen and you're out of the way up there. Do you think it was at Aberdeen that you came to terms with it? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, at Aberdeen I came to terms with it. And maybe, like you've already mentioned the, the terminology there in, in a coping mechanism, maybe that was me saying, well, you know, this is me 
So I'm just, I'm not this, I'm not going to go, go any further, but there's still a chance, as yeah. there was, that even if I left Aberdeen, somebody would still, you know, take me either in Scotland yeah, or back yeah. down in England again. So you had a bit of a, a fuck it. Yeah, but while, fuck I, it, while I'm here, here, I'm going to enjoy myself. I took, it as, a, I took yeah. it as a free hit, yeah. which is, which I've just explained to you was, was wrong of me because I still had time on my side to be able to to get myself back playing at a decent level back down in England when my time at Aberdeen mm. was up but I, I just I didn't give it enough yeah. respect if you like you've had 10 years of frustration as well probably just then thought just let it out yeah and most probably going to boozer and most doing probably. what you wanted it's, yeah. it's how people deal with it isn't it sometimes and it, yeah and it was wrong completely wrong were you fighting it were you fighting the drink uh, was no. It wrong, no 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 I wasn't no because um, I was very much a binge drinker so I, I would go out on a Saturday night and I would do 72 hours 72 yeah I probably would so, certainly 36 anyway I'd do 36 hours boozing and then as I, I when I, I sort of came not came round but when I'd shaken it all out of my system I had my sauna on the Monday afternoon and got rid of everything then I was ready to put the work in again Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and I wouldn't be tempted but then once I started to get myself well once once I wasn't in the team anymore then the temptation came mm. that well you know I, I, I went out and I partied but I left it alone for the rest of the week because I was working towards playing on a Saturday, which I was doing. But once he started to leave me out of the team, I, I had an even more of a fuck it moment when I just thought, well, I'm not even working. I'm not even doing anything. So what's mm. the point of me staying in? I can still go and I can still train, but instead I'm going to, rather than sitting in an evening watching TV, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out and have a few beers. And that just snowballed. Did you feel like you just give up in a way? A little bit, yeah. A little bit, which saddens me. Mm. Which saddens me when I when I realised the potential that I had as a kid um, to seeing or to remembering back to, <laughs> to some of the the scrapes I got myself in and 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 the like and and the the amount of time that I did spend, especially at Aberdeen boozing. Then I, I knew that I'd I'd let myself down and and perhaps let others down as well, who'd supported me through throughout but, a lot. It was tough though, isn't it? It's tough when you, you pretty much from when you you got injured. That was pretty much a bonus, really. If you if, if you feel that. Oh, definitely. You know, like the fact yeah. that you had ten, twelve years, bon their bonus years because yeah, you could have been done. Yes, completely. Mm. So completely. you've enjoyed yourself and you thought, and even though you might say you regret it, you still had ten, twelve years. Longer than what a lot of people are. Yes. Like. And, and, and you've had a fucking good kick at ball, it sounds. And, that, <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably my justification for it, is that, yeah, I, you know, it could have been over with when I was 18 mm. and I never would have got that chance. And, yeah, you, I mean, you do, you, you, you sort of get to, you, you get the feeling that, like, you know, things are going all right for me all of a sudden. And maybe at 18, you know, I could have been doing something completely different because my knee wouldn't have allowed me to carry on playing football but you know we've all been there you know what it's like you, you know you go out you play football things go well for you and you know you get female attention and blah 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 I've and, never had, I've never had a lot <laughs> <laughs> I've never had a lot <laughs> you Chris? nah no, no, no. I know fucking you I've had loads <laughs> oh I'll tell you have you, uh, have you had your barnard done by the way? yeah <laughs> I, was, I was wondering why you were looking so well. Yeah, I had um, I had it done on the. Th what a fucking personal question. I've been thinking about it all day. <laughs> 30th, I thought there's someone not right here. Yeah, thirtieth of November I had it done. You so, haven't got the contact details for. Know, yeah, <laughs> give us. A, yeah, I had it done. Any discounts? They just uh, <laughs> they just they, one of a, a, my ex an ex teammate of mine his missus started doing all the PR for this company. And um, and he just said, "Listen, we can we can get it done for you at, at a discounted rate." And it, again, it was nothing because it's a lot of money. And I thought, I, you know, if I'm 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 just, I w I wasn't far off the stage where I was just going to go. That's me, you know. Don't that's good. I thought I thought he was about to say I wasn't no, far off no, the stage. No, from no, that, from no, that. No, I know, no, 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 no. The hand came out. <laughs> <in your book. laughs> You, yeah, it's good that, wasn't it? 
so <laughs> so yeah I'd, and I just thought do you know what and I said to me and the first thing that people say is oh fucking I didn't realise you were that vain and, and I just thought do you know what I'm not at all it's just that you get an opportunity like that and people and most people have just said do you know what you get an opportunity like that and yeah take it you, see you you don't need it I don't like poor suction the, the, the live <laughs> suction as well. yeah, discount you on don't that, need I it either no. you don't need it but yeah I, I have had it done so I'm waiting now to see are you going to go for the curtains I'll go, no the curtains you're going to go back to the curtains get them back nah. <laughs> hey listen do you know what? if it ever gets to that stage I will gladly do it yeah I will gladly do it 45 year old curtains that's great that <laughs> wouldn't it Undercut like these in here <laughs> yeah <laughs> Has so. the um, have, you, have you enjoyed the re- reliving it through the book and everything? I, I read a quote from your brother saying that he almost seems like it's the happiest that you've been since the book. Yeah, uh, I, I think that getting you know doing that was very cathartic and and it, it sort of like I said it helped me to exercise a, a few demons that were probably still maybe lurking at yeah. the back of my mind somewhere. But I think that the way that these lads came together and, and helped me out and the way that Dan, the guy that co-wrote it, uh, put it all together. And once I'd read it, I thought, Do you know what? I, nobody can ever take that away from me. I don't care how it does, mm. but the way that he's written it and the fact that these these lads have got involved will yeah. be, especially to Man United fans, will be of 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 interest to to certain people mm. and uh, and I was I've been really pleased with that don't like I said don't care really how many sales that have of it's made but what I I am always interested to read is what, how how it had been received, received. Yeah. what people thought yeah, how it did you been find received. it personally therapeutic very it? much so yeah but very like much clo- so feel like closure for you a little- yes a little bit of closure and it had a little bit of everything you know it had a little bit of the you know the sadness part of it with the injury it had a little bit of you know obviously fun stuff about people taking the piss out of me and, and me taking the piss out of myself and and as every footballer's book should have a little bit of the old <laughs> I'll have to, I'll, I didn't put much in mine. I'm about shagging. But I listen. Yeah. I listened to you on Oxby and Jacobs. All right. Yeah, yeah I listened to you because yeah. you were you went on a couple of weeks before me. Well, I got uh, a few tips. Were you, did you go on around sort of? I don't know. Was it like sort of August September yeah, it time? Yeah, would have been. Yeah. Yeah, because I went on. I went on around. Well, around the time that mine came out. So yeah. I really liked them too. Yeah, they were way. good. Mate. I, I were a bit like, why the fuck are these wanting me? I, I was the same. <laughs> you know I, mean? I was the same. Yeah, I was the same. Well, I, got, they, I got kicked off uh, radio. Was it radio, radio two? Yeah, <laughs> radio oh, two after about six, fifty seconds. <laughs> 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 like, fucking what have I done? <laughs> so I said. Lap dancing Paul. I think <laughs> twice. It's a family show. Right, thank you, John. Thank you, Matt. I was thinking, oh, for fuck's sake. I've had, I've had this chance. I've had this chance to on BBC Radio 2 and I fucked it up after 50 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> I thought publishers are going to be fucking raging with me. But Brilliant. It actually worked out better because it got, I think it got people That's half awesome. interested yeah, in it. Yeah, of course it does, yeah. Yeah, yeah of course it does. Hell. Well, I think uh, I'd definitely recommend the book to anybody to get out there. We'll put the... Uh, Put the link in the description yeah. and yeah, in the thing, you know, because they can get out and I get think, on it. I think there, uh, there's a paperback version going to be out, you know, for you know people travelling and stuff like that. It's yeah. a lot easier, um, and there'll be a few uh, extra things added into that. Um, words from Sir Alex Ferguson because I couldn't get them at the time because just when we'd made the arrangement to do it, he, he had his hospitalisation, right, yeah, so yeah. I couldn't do that. Um, and there's. There was one. There's one or two more bits in as well. Uh, oh, Eric Harrison's funeral. Right. Uh, or yeah. a, a little bit more on Eric because obviously subsequently he couldn't do anything with the book because of his dementia. Mm. And and obviously yeah, na- yeah. before this comes out, obviously in between times he's yeah. he's passed away. Mm. So yeah, there'll be, there'll be a few extra little snippets in there. But yeah, yeah, definitely get on it. It's quite. But before because we, we asked uh, David May. Best player out of that ninety two? Scalzi. Same again. Yeah, yeah he, he was he came from absolutely nowhere because he di- he never played when we won it in the in ninety two. Yeah. He never played and he went away and he, he even he says I had to have a look at myself. Um and by God did he ever do that because without question 
I mean, I was very, very fortunate to have played with some unbelievable players. Giggsy and what he's done. Um, I mean, Bex was a mate of mine, but a tremendous player. Gaz was the same, he just worked hard. Um, Brian Robson, hero. Eric Cantona. Do you know what I mean? The list is pretty much endless, but Scolzi for me, technically and mentally, the, the best player I've, I've ever played with. Did what, were Phil Neville Eric, ever... Any good? Jealous of Gary being better than him? In my opinion. Um, I don't think he was, no. I think or were they happy for him? Or? I, oh, no, definitely. They were very close. So they, were, they were happy for each other and they helped each other big time. I mean, Phil, Phil played right back, left back. He played centre, centre, mid, centre midfield mm. as well, mm. which is where I saw him mark Patrick Vieira out of a game once at Old Trafford playing against Arsenal. I just think that with Phil, he was perhaps, whereas Gaz had nailed that right back spot down for 10, 12 years as his own. Mm. I think Phil was perhaps knew that he was he was going to be in and out. He was going to be shifting a little bit more into into other positions and uh, and maybe the the right back spot that came available at Everton. He, he oh, left back. I can't remember which one it was. He knew that he was going to get that and and he, he knew he was going to be playing regularly. Yeah. But they were both tremendous players. Mm. They were both tremendous players. I mean, Phil probably technically better than Gary as as kids, but Gaz just worked so so hard to be to be good at, at what he was good at. Mm. He's good at the punditry, isn't he? Very. Yeah. Listen to them all day, man. There's nobody, there's no, I think they work brilliantly together. Yeah. And and we haven't seen Jamie and Gaz together for a while on Monday Night Football and I just think it's it's priceless TV. Mm. And for, for anybody who wants to learn anything about the game, that hour before the game that, goes on kicks off when they're looking back and, and the way that they analyse things I think they're both absolutely brilliant mm. and they combine well together Is that right when Neville was playing he used to look after the young lads as contracts and stuff? Yes yeah not everybody but it, Gaz always made himself available um, for players to go in and, and, and see and see him if uh, yeah. if he if because he, he knew that the manager wasn't keen on agents um, so just to, I bet that was that was great for the lads. It was great, but it was strange because uh, because the manager because Gaz would be fighting for the player. Yeah. And obviously, the manager is somebody oh, so who's took completely it that set. far that he'd be uh, negotiating. Oh, yeah. Yes, he oh, would. Right, yeah. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, he would. Yeah. And basically, if it, I he, thought you just meant a bit of advice. If no, you no, no. He, a player. If they asked him to do it, he would go and negotiate against the manager, if you like. Right. And get him the best deal that he possibly could. I bet that was but a he was so mental. But he was so knowledgeable. Wall, it? He was so knowledgeable, and the manager had so much respect for him that he, he was he would rather have dealt with Gary, although he probably has gone on record at saying that he'd probably rather do yeah. <laughs> Gaz, Gaz is a nightmare to deal with <laughs> give me an agent any time but no he, he knew that he had the lad's best interest at heart yeah. rather than he, he knew that some agents have, had only got their own interests at mm. heart how were him and Keane two massive characters probably leaders in the dressing room did they get on like uh, uh, Gary, Gary yeah, yeah, and yeah, Keane yeah absolutely just respect no, each yeah, other yeah absolutely well go back to the um, go back to the incident in the tunnel at Arsenal Mm. And and and, yeah, he, yeah. and Keeney uses that. Um, you, you're always having a pop at Gary Neville. Well, I tell you what, why don't we get out there and come and have a pop at me? Yeah. So no, no, no. He, he, they they got on fine. They got on fine. <laughs> he must have been thinking, fuck, because Keeney's not that much bigger than Neville, is he really? No. In fact, Neville's probably bigger than him. Um, there's not much in it. There ain't much in it. But he, no, they, they <laughs> he's kind of babbied him off, aren't he? Like? <laughs> no, they they got on absolutely fine. Picking up my little little brother at school. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know? Yeah. Do you know? Keeney, Keeney didn't. He, he realised that there was going to be a different level of not massively, but there were players that were going to be more skillful than others. But what he loved about Gaz was the fact that he was prepared to give everything, and that's all he asked. If you gave everything to, to the cause, both in training and in matches, and if you did it in training, he believed that you would do it in matches anyway, which is why he used to go nuts for, for you giving the ball away. But he recognised very, very quickly that, that the lads that had come from like the class of 92, they were going to help the team and, and they, were, they were plenty good enough. Plenty good enough. Brilliant, Cheers, man. mate. Thanks yeah, for your time. Thank you very much. Really so far, it's been great. I just wish I'd have Tackle. been here for it all. Can we do it again next week? <laughs> <laughs> on, and I won't be in the car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like out, out in the beehive. You get out red wine. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, ah, mate. Nice yeah, thank you very much. Could, uh, if you could give us the number for that, that uh, job. 
Okay. You're not a fucking miracle worker. You know what I mean? <laughs>